Good morning. So, first of all, I um, emailed everyone their tests back, I believe. If you didn't get it, you can... No, that's a lie. There was one person who took it in the library whose test I haven't emailed them back. But everyone else, I think I have. Oh, we're already recording. That's fine. So we talked last week about, I mean, we talked about convergence and we talked about a few specific tests. We talked about the comparison test, which I was not super enthusiastic about, and the limit comparison test, which I thought was a little more interesting. But the really significant test were convergence and divergence is the test we're going to look at today. And this is called the ratio test. And the ratio test, before we um, go any further, that's um, state a supplemental definition. The ratio test is a test for a stronger property than convergence. The ratio test is looking at absolute convergence. And um, that's there for star with a definition and a theorem. And the theorem will come first. If a series of absolute values converges, then the series without absolute value converges. And in fact, we say that the series without absolute values converges absolutely. And most of the series that have concrete applications, like most of the series we're going to use later in chapter 10, that converge, converge absolutely. They have this stronger problem. So let's state this explicitly. I mean, it's kind of implicit in the wording. I mean, if you say something does something absolutely, presumably it does it. And absolute convergence implies convergence. So if a series converges absolutely, the series converges. But the, uh, the vice versa of that is not true. Something can converge, but not converge absolutely. And we'll give examples of that probably in the next section. Absolute convergence is a good property. And we're not going to dwell on this. 
But if we give a new definition, we should probably at least try to give some indication of why anyone might care about this new definition. Absolute convergence means we can treat an infinite sum like a finite sum. Let's cast our minds back to Grandy's series. Grandy's series was an infinite bunch of ones being added and subtracted together. And I said that if you try to treat this infinite sum, like a finite sum, you get all these weird properties. Like if you had a finite sum, addition is associative, so you could put in those parentheses wherever you like. And then you have a bunch of zeros being added together, and the result of adding a bunch of zeros together is zero. On the other hand, if this were a finite sum, you could also rewrite it like this. And now the result should be one. One minus zero, minus zero, minus zero, and so on. One minus a bunch of zeros is one. And this is stuff you could do if you had finite sums. If you have, if you had the finite sum, one minus one plus one minus one, you can certainly put parentheses in. If you have the finite sum, one minus one plus one. You can certainly rewrite it like that. So the moral of the story was that infinite sums aren't finite sums. We might be using the addition symbol, but you can't treat them in that way. Um, absolute convergence stops anything like that from happening. If you have absolute convergence, you can rearrange all of the terms. You can put in parentheses wherever it's appropriate and it doesn't change anything. So an absolute convergent series doesn't do strange things like this. <laughs> and in one sense, that's not really relevant. I mean, we're not actually going to rearrange terms of absolute convergent series. Mainly though, um, the theorem or the result we're about to present as these absolute values in them. So I think it's useful to, prevent, to present this concept so that those absolute values aren't just 
coming out of nowhere. Um, it makes sense that absolute values should show up in a convergence test. Because if the absolute values converge, then the series also converges. And now I've probably built this up far more than it needed to be, or maybe built it up sufficiently. But here's the ratio S. You have a series, and you want to know whether the series converges or diverges. And the ratio test is a lot more general than the tests we've looked at previously in a few ways. Um, there's no positivity condition, first of all. We looked at the comparison test and we looked at the limit comparison test. And both of those require that we have a positive series. You do not see anything like that written on the board here. Um, the integral test, which I totally forgot for a few seconds, also requires the series to be positive. Again, nothing like that here. So um, it's good in that regard. The integral test had these kind of continuity requirements. We don't have anything like that here. The only thing we uh, require to use the ratio test is that we have to know what the A sub n's are. And then if we do, we can attempt it. And the ratio test says a ratio is a fraction. So that's what we're expecting. It says take the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n plus one divided by a sub n all surrounded by absolute values. And we take this limit, and the limit might be less than one, in which case the series converges and in fact, it does better than converge. It converges absolutely. So it converges and you can rearrange terms and throw in parentheses and treat it as if it's a finite sum. Or the limit could be greater than one, and the series could diverge. Unfortunately, here's the fly in the ointment. The ratio test can fail. It's possible that you use the ratio test and you do not get any information about convergence or divergence. So that's unfortunate because aside from this possibility of failure, the ratio test has a lot going for it. 
I already mentioned, it doesn't have these restrictions that everything has to be positive. Um, it works really well with um, factorials, as we'll see once we start doing examples. And I've mentioned that factorials show up in a lot of important applications. And very useful from a kind of working mathematicians or students point of view, the ratio test is completely mechanical. If you're trying to use, say, the limit comparison test, you have to have some intuition. I think this series looks like that series which converges, or I think this series looks like that series that diverges. The ratio test requires no intuition at all to attempt. It's a pure the algebraic slash limit taking test that you can use even if you have no idea what the series looks like, and no intuition about whether it converges or diverges. Um, before I do an example, just a word, um, where is this coming from? Well, the um, In order to converge, the terms of a series have to be going to zero. That's the nth term S. And I mean, they have to be doing more than that. The harmonic series, the terms go to zero and the series diverges. But this is basically just the idea of the ratio test. I mean, a fraction is less than one if the top is smaller than the bottom. So we're looking at the terms of the series and we're saying, well, they're shrinking because in this fraction, this fraction is getting to be less than one. The, you know, the seventh term should be less than the sixth term, and the 10,000th term should be less than the 999th term, and so on. So this is, I mean, this test is just sort of giving the intuition that the series is shrinking down to zero. Uh, you have to be, I guess, one more word of warning before we hit um, some examples. Um, it's easy. We have the ratio test and we have the limit comparison test. And I think it's easy to get those things um, confused because in both of those cases, you're taking the limit of a ratio. In the case of the ratio test, it's the ratio we have on the board. In the case of the limit comparison test, it's A sub n over B sub n, where B sub n is the other series. And it's important not to kind of um, to confuse them, of course, because the tests work very differently. If you're using the limit comparison test and you get a limit of one, that's great, everything's fine. One is a positive number and the test is working. If you're using the ratio test and you get a limit of one, the test has failed. So even though they both involve taking these limits, they're very different. And, it, and it's important not to conflate them. 
Does anyone, before we go ahead and do an actual example, does anybody have any questions about, about the idea behind this test? So I said, I said that this test works well with fat that's put my money where my mouth is and see if I can investigate the convergence or divergence of one over n factorial. Um, none of the other tests clearly work. So we'll try the limit comparison test. And the limit comparison test is algebraically intense or at least it can be algebraically intense. For our first example, we won't make things super difficult, but, um, well, first of all, we have to remember, you know, we have a sub n, we have a sub n to the first. Now here's, a sub n, so like a sub n, one over n factorial, no problem. A sub n plus one is going to be one over n plus one factorial. And I'm going to have to erase that so that I'll have room to write, give people a second to copy it somewhere in their notes. So we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n plus one factorial divided by one over n factorial. And basically any time you use this ratio test, you're going to get a fraction divided by a fraction. So your algebra has to be on a point here. We have to remember how to simplify an improper fraction like this. And the trick is going to be to multiply top and bottom by the reciprocal of that denominator. And we're going to wind up with the limit as n goes to infinity of n factorial over n plus one factorial. And we've got this absolute value. And what I want, oh, I know it's knowing when my leg starts to itch. We, um, 
We have this absolute value, but the absolute value isn't doing anything. So that's the thing that I'd like for us to recognize next. N factorial is positive. It's a bunch of positive numbers being multiplied together. N plus one factorial, exact same statement. It's a bunch of positive numbers being multiplied together. The only thing the absolute value does is make negative numbers positive. So if everything is positive to start with, that absolute value isn't doing anything. And now we've got a limit to take. And your first instinct might be that this limit, we don't know what to do. I mean, this is indeterminate. The top and the bottom are both going to infinity, but we can't use L'Hopital's rule because the fact isn't something we can differentiate. Um, but the reason the ratio, I said the ratio test works really well with factorials. The reason is that when you divide a factorial by another factorial, stuff cancels. So let me remind everyone I asked at some point whether everyone remembered what a factorial was and everyone in the room nodded, but just to be on the safe side, let's remember what a factorial is. So a factorial of a number is that number time, um, at least for this class, we'll, we can only take the factorial of integers, um, of positive integers. And the factorial of a number is that number times the next smallest integer times the next smallest integer until we get down to one. These things show up a lot in the probability. If you've ever taken a probability class, they also, as it turns out, show up a lot in the calculus. So n factorial is n times n minus one, the next integer times n minus two times n minus three. And we just keep going down until we reach one. n plus one factorial is n plus one. The next smallest integer is n, then n minus one, n minus two, and we keep counting down until we reach one. And basically everything in this fraction cancels. That's what makes these factorials work so well under the ratio test. The n's cancel. The n minus one's cancel. The n minus two's cancel. I didn't write the n minus three in the denominator, but those cancel down to the threes and the twos and even the ones. 
and at the end of all of this cancellation, we get a limit that we can hopefully take without issue. This isn't, doesn't require a L'Hopital's rule or anything. This is a determinant form. The limit is zero. Now, again, you, it's easy to for, uh, confuse these things. If this were the limit comparison test, this would be bad. Did you get for using the limit comparison test, getting zero is a failure. For the ratio test, there's nothing special about um, zero. Zero is just a number that's less than one. And because this number is less than one, this series converges. Using the ratio test. Let's let's do an example, a slightly more complicated example. Um, where, where the series diverges using the ratio test. And that's also, at some point, we might not get to both examples today, but we should look at an example where we have negative terms and see how we work with those and the absolute value. For now, we'll also, tomorrow, probably, um, it will be, I expect, have you work some examples in class. I never do as much of that as I want to, but this is a good opportunity. Let's look at, at who and back divided by three to the power of n plus one. And um, there's often, often might be overstating it, but there's sometimes more than one way to um, determine whether a series converges or diverges. Um, this series, you can actually use the nth term test, assuming, I mean, to use the nth term test, you need to take the limit as n goes to infinity of, of this fraction. And it turns out that this limit is greater than zero. So this thing diverges via the n term test, but it's possible, I would go so far as to say likely, that we don't know how to take this limit. L'Hopital's rule fails because we don't know how to differentiate and just can't differentiate the factorial. So, even though there's other valid ways of approaching this problem, let's hit it with the ratio test. Let's 
there's all of this bookkeeping to do when you use the ratio test. I kind of like it. I find it faintly hypnotic, but I also recognize that for many people, it's probably just kind of annoying, not much to do about that. We've got the limit of a big fraction. In the denominator, we've got the terms A sub N, nothing else to do. In the top, we've got A sub N plus one. So every appearance of N is going to be replaced with N plus one. You see this N here, I replaced with N plus one, and this N here, I replaced with N plus one. And now we're Always is a strong word, but 99 times out of 100, when we use the ratio test, we get an improper fraction like this. A fraction divided by a fraction. And we have to know how to deal with these improper fractions. I've said this before, but it remains true. We have to multiply both top and bottom by the reciprocal of the bottom. And then, I mean, in the bottom stuff will cancel. In the top, um, this is all happening inside the absolute value, first of all. So in the top, let me group my terms over each other. That's always going to be sort of the thing we do before we start simplifying. And when I talk about grouping my terms, you see this fraction and this fraction both have a factorial in them. So we're going to put the factorials over each other. This, first of all, this is 2n plus 2. So the 2n plus 2 factorial in the top, we're going to put over the 2n factorial in the bottom. And the exponential equations were the exponential expressions. Did not mean to erase that, but no harm done. We've got an exponential in the top and an exponential in the bottom. And we'll put those over each other. The three 
to the n plus one divided by three to the n plus two. I uh, n plus one plus one that I have circled over here is n plus two. And now we we simplify these. Um, the ratio test works well with exponential functions for the same reason that it uh, that it works well with um, factorials, which is that when you have exponentials divided by each other, stuff simplifies. Um, in particular, this is one third. If that's not obvious, we can we can go through this. If our bases absolute insistence on accidentally erasing stuff, if the bases are the same, so three, then this division is done by subtracting the powers and we wind up with three to the negative first. So if it wasn't, if um, it wasn't clear, that's where the one third comes from. Let's go to another frame. And look at the factorial, 2n plus 2 factorial over 2n factorial. Let me just look at the top. So we have 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1. Um, times 2n, I, and now we keep counting down, 2n minus 1, 2n minus 2, and we count down to 1. That's 2n plus 2 factorial, and this 2n times 2n minus 1 times 2n minus 2 times 2n minus 3, counting down to 1. This, ooh, probably the yellow is an ill-advised color, but that's 2n factorial. So when we have this division, we've got this 2n fact, um, we've got this whole thing being divided by 2n factorial. And all of this cancels the 2n factorial. And we're left with 2n plus 2 times 2n plus 1, when all of the dust clears. Before we go any further, I mean, this specific 
the specific step. Let me erase that and face it with something people can actually see. Is everybody comfortable with this argument, with this sort of partial cancellation, where the denominator gets rid of some, but not all of the factorial in the numerator? Because this is an argument we're going to end up making a lot in various examples going forward. And if everybody is happy with that, we're taking the limit. I haven't gotten rid of of the absolute value yet, um, but we've got the 2n plus 2, the 2n plus 1, and then those exponentials gave us a third. Um, the absolute value isn't really hurting anything. I mean, I said I haven't gotten rid of it yet. We don't have to if we don't want. 2n plus 2 is going to infinity, 2n plus 1 is going to infinity, infinity times infinity times one third is infinity, and the absolute value of infinity is infinity. Um, Another way of going about this, just like we did in the last example, we can say 2n plus 2 is positive, and 2n plus 1 is positive, and 1 third is positive. So everything's positive. That absolute value is, isn't really doing anything. Either way, the limit is in. Yeah. And um, I mean, properly speaking, I guess you'd say, where is the ratio test? I mean, infinity isn't a number. The limit doesn't exist. We're going to not be too uh, persnickety about our terminology. We're just going to think, okay, infinity is certainly greater than one. So we'll apply the ratio test and we'll find that the series diverges. And excellent timing. This example is over. Class is also over. I'll see you tomorrow, right and early.